When someone asks you if you are Christian, what do you say? When I'm asked if I'm a Christian, I say this. I believe in the teachings of Jesus. I believe that there's no teachings that have ever been clearer. And when they ask me, what do you mean by that? I simply say to them this. I said, Jesus said a couple things very clearly. He said there are two commandments. To love God above all else and to love thy neighbor as thyself. To love God above all else means to love life. To love life and everything in it above all else. And in the loving of life, we love ourselves because we're the individualization of that presence. And then if we love life and we love ourselves, then we must love everyone else because everyone else is that expression. And I said, and Jesus said it so clearly. He said, the power is within you. The power is the Father within. And then he clarified that and he says, it is done unto you as you believe. So if you ask me, do I believe in Jesus? I said, I believe in what Jesus taught because Jesus had a mission. And he said that mission very clearly to us. He said, I come so that you may have life more abundantly. And he said, I am the teacher, I am the way. He didn't say, believe in me. He said, it is done unto you as to what you believe. So in that respect, I am a Christian. And if they ask me, do I take Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior? I said, no, I don't. And they would say, why, can't, why don't you? I said, because that's not what Jesus taught. That's what man has created around that. And then I'm asked sometimes, and this is when I get bold, because sometimes I'll be approached by Christian ministers, and I'll be asked, well, the Bible says this, and they keep going back to the Bible for me, and I simply say this to them. I said, the Bible is a magnificent book with magnificent wisdom, but it is not my only source. I said, the Bhagavad Gita is a great source. The Torah and the Korah, they're all divine inspired, and what we look for is what is love. And I say this, I have a religion. If you were to ask me what is my religion, my religion is a religion of love. So if you want to talk to me about inclusivity, if you want to talk to me about appreciating the magnificence of you are, if you want to talk to me, how can we be more loving, then yes, I'm a Christian. But if you want to talk to me about separation, if you want to talk to me about damnation, if you want to talk to me about hell, then I'm not. Because those are things that Jesus did not teach. Is that clear enough? How did you meet Stur Steve Curry and the band and decide to have them perform at your services? <laughs> Thank you for making that decision. <laughs> Steve Curry used to play at the Center for Spiritual Living in Dallas. And Steve would come in once or twice a month and he would rock. He would literally rock because you haven't heard him today, the new people. This man is one of the greatest guitar players in the Southwest. He can, he can do it. You name it, he does it. Stevie Ray Vaughan, Pink Floyd, we do all that stuff here. And he does that type of thing. And what happened is we had sort of, when we started Agape, we had more of a jazz, folk type of sound. And that musician decided they wanted to do other things. And then we tapped into Steve and we asked Steve, and he's been with us now for about two and a half years. And the music that, he's already got enough music, he's gonna be putting a CD together because he's writing these phenomenal songs that are unique to us. Because one of the things I will share with you is that every spiritual center has a unique energy. No spiritual center is better than another. But you're gonna find that what you're gonna to come to is you're gonna to gravitate to a center that has a vibration that is, a set, that is what you're vibrating at. Here, I'm the minister. I vibrate to rock and roll. Guess what? You get rock and roll. Simple as that. The music is, not as, mu is as much for you as it is for me because the music sets up my talk. So when, I, when you come in, the music that is being played here, the, the idea of it is to raise the vibration in the room and to raise your vibration so that you are more receptive to hearing ideas that will stimulate you as you create your life. We've talked a lot about letting people who don't fit into our paths go, those with negative energy and so forth. I need a few more reminders of the words to possibly use when we are confronted with these people trying to get in and uh, in, into our lives. Einstein st said this very clearly. Everything is energy vibrating at a specific speed. E equals MC squared. So wherever you are, your thoughts are creating the energetic vibration within your body. So if you have a vibration and you come together with another person, they are vibrating in another way. 
When the vibrations are similar, it's easy to be with them. When the vibrations are different, it's hard to be with them. When the vibrations are drastically different, it becomes very painful to be with them. When it's painful to be with them, you have an emotional guidance system that is within you. And with that emotional guidance system, it's telling you when are you in vibrational alignment and when are you not. When you're not in vibrational alignment, you know because of how you feel. At that moment, you have the ability to make a choice. And that choice is, do I shift my vibration to be able to fit in this person? Or do I hold my vibration and allow them to come up to where I'm at? What I would suggest to you is that if you, if you, when you're in that situation of contrast, feel the, the difference, ask the question, am I vibrating in love? And if you truly believe there's non-judgment in love, then you don't lower your vibration to allow the other to come to you because it does not suit to lower your vibration. Instead of one person being out of love, now you will have two. The question is, is that when it becomes so painful to be around someone, you start asking the question, is this serving me? If it's not serving you, I don't say anything. I just gently move away. I do this at parties, at gatherings. It doesn't matter who I'm around. If I'm at the Chamber of Commerce where I'm at every Thursday morning in Frisco, I'm there every Thursday morning, and people come up and they start talking to me. If they're not vibrating at my level, I know because I'm so tuned into it that the second I say, hello, how are you, and I'm very gracious, if they're not vibrating where I'm at, I gently say, have a great day, and I move to where I am going to vibrate because I realize there's a way of being with people, and you do not have to force your personality. You do not have to force yourself, and you don't have to do anything. People will gently move away from you. When you vibrate at a high level of love, people who are in fear will not be around you. They cannot handle that vibration. It's too extreme for them. The key thing is to become aware. Are you vibrating in love or are you vibrating in lack or non-love, in fear? That's where, that's where the real work comes is can you really see the difference or is it ego saying, I want to be right? If it's saying, I want to be right, if anything you're doing is, I want to be right here, that's ego. That's not love. One of the things in my marriage, I use this say, statement all the time. Would I rather be happy or would I rather be right? There are a few moments when I choose to be right. And I want you to know it's not very happy. <laughs> and then I'll come to my senses and choose to be happy Make an apology and say, yes, you were right all along. For you new people, all the others are looking over there because my wife's sitting in the front row. What's the easiest, most direct way to explain what God is to a child? First off, you cannot explain what God is. There are no words. There are no words to describe the infinite. The second you put a word around the infinite, you limit it. But what you can do with a child is you can say, what does it feel like for you when you feel so very good inside? What does it feel like for you when you feel so free? What does it feel like when you feel this unconditional desire that you want to hug someone or tell them you love them? What does it feel like when you want to create something and you've got this desire that you want to do this and nothing gets in your way? What does it feel like when you can just move and dance and glide and glow and do that? And when you can take that child and you can anchor them into a feeling, they will know God. If you were to sit back and think about your earliest memory of what is God, you'll find that it wasn't anything other than a feeling. Mine was at the age of seven, walking up the back stairway to the choir loft in the Catholic church at midnight mass. As I was, a, I was about this tall, and I had on my white shirt with my blue pants, with my black shoes, with my black socks, and a white tie, because that's what little boys wore. And we were going to sing Christmas Eve service. But when I was walking up, there was a feeling, and I can't describe it, that just came over me. And then we got up there and we were looking out from the back down. And as we looked down, 
this feeling just overwhelmed me and we started to sing and tears just filled my eyes. That's when I knew God. That's my first conscious memory of knowing God. And it's a feeling and I, can't, I can tell you the circumstances but I can't tell you what the feeling was. You have to feel that for yourself. Give your thoughts about death. One of the belief statements that we have at Agape is this. We believe in the eternality, the immortality, and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. When we use the term soul, we mean the individualization of consciousness. So if you take quantum physics and says consciousness is the ground of all being, meaning consciousness is everywhere, consciousness creates, consciousness is the creation. So in that, each of us is an individualization of that consciousness. We're a point of consciousness that has the freedom to create. So if we are that point of consciousness, meaning that all consciousness is infinite, constantly becoming more, constantly creating, we are that. So we are the microcosm of the macrocosm. And knowing that the consciousness has always been and always will be, we will always be in that. We just won't be in physical form. What we come to understand is that when the physical body is no longer serving the soul's ability to elevate itself, to have a higher expression, a higher experience of oneness, the, the soul lays the body down because the body is no longer serving. And in that, the soul then moves out of the body and goes to its next path of creation, its next path of expansion. You see, being that everything is infinite, in that idea of infinite, it means it is always becoming more. So to think that we're going to ever get something done in this lifetime is the great lie that we've been faced with and it's creating all of the stress that we live with in our lives because I got to have this done, I got to have this done, I've got this done. If I don't do this, you're never going to get it done. I remember so clearly being with my mother when she was making her transition and mom was, um, she was a small woman, four foot eleven. She weighed 103 pounds normally. She was probably now down to 80 pounds. She was breathing her last breath. She died of breast cancer. Um, and she could barely talk. And I said, Mom, is there anything I can do to bring you peace so that you can pass into the next creation more easily? And she looked at me squeezed my finger and said, be love. And this little grin came on her face. I knew she got it. And so it wasn't but a few hours later that mom passed. But she had found her peace. She understood it meant to go forward and she was there. She had found that. When we're dying, this is what I've come to understand as I witness people dying They will take as long to die as it is for them to find and understand that this life doesn't end with death. That this life is a beginning. And for some people that can look very painful, but the pain has to be there to spark the contrast for them to seek outside of that. You see, contrast, by extreme contrast, you have to turn away to something else. And when you turn away, what do you turn to? When you're so dark, you're so into the, the bowels of fear of death, you turn to what? You turn to life. And what is life? It's light. So when you talk about near-death experiences, everyone who is going on a near-death experience talks about they're moving to the light. You see, and that's what we all go through at that time. And when you talk with people, you ask them. So the greatest gift you can give someone when they're dying is, please, don't stay back here for me. I know this is your path. I honor it. Please, I love you. Go. You will allow them the freedom to move more quickly. How will I know when it's time to make a career change or retire? Well, if you're fired, that's a great time to make a career change. <laughs> if you have so much pain in your life that you're doing the wrong thing, then you have to ask the question, is the pain a result of the attitude that I am or am I doing something that is not my life joy? 
Uh, the question, everyone, every motivational speaker you've ever heard has always talked about this. If you're doing what you love, you're going to love what you're doing. So you've got to find the idea, are you doing what you love? I was brought up that I was a math whiz. I was an intellectual type of guy, and I got into the business world. And for 32 years in the corporate world, I did that. I was a director of financial planning and analysis for 27 of those years at a large corporation. I then became the marketing vice president. So I did the left brain activity. I finally took a test in ministerial school, and it said you're 71% right brain. I went all of this life, this life up until about 2004, where I was living something that made me tired all the time. And then when I found out that I was this other person and I started acting from that side of the brain, I have energy galore. I'm up at 4.30 every morning and I go to sleep at 9.30 every night. And my days are just packed with joy. It took me until 2004 to find my joy. It's a journey. So you don't beat yourself up if you're not in a job that's soothing you right now, but you open yourself up to the idea of what is it mine, that's, what is the joy within me de desiring to express. I do not believe in retirement. The idea of retirement, most people my age are retired. That's what I was told. Everyone I know in the corporate world has already retired. The idea is when you retire, you're saying to the world, I'm not going to create anymore, therefore it's time for me to die. And so as soon as you find out, people who retire, what you find out is very shortly afterwards, most of them die because there's nothing being created. Here's the kicker. Let's look at this really clearly. Remember before we were talking about being infinite? Being infinite means we're always going to be creating. When we're creating, our bodies realize we're creating. Our bodies stay young. The second we start saying, I'm not going to create, our bodies start to de deteriorate, and we start the death process. So I believe the more you're creating, the more you're expanding, the you more youthful you're going to stay. And I'm a believer that with the idea of death, it's happy, healthy, happy, healthy, happy, healthy. Create, 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 happy, 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 happy. Then stop, and I'm dead. Just like that, I'm dead. I'll plan my death so I'm gone like this. It was fascinating when I came back from my India excursion where I went through that natural disaster and Jean was, came up to me and she hugged me and she was concerned for my safety because there we were, stranded in India. Had to be helicoptered out, all of this stuff. A lot of you have heard the story. I looked at her and said, you didn't need to fear. I said, I'll tell you when I'm going to go. I'm that sure about when I'm going to die that I will let her know so that if she's around, because I plan on living 124 years, I'm not sure that's her intention. You know, she may have 123 and then will die at the same time because she is a year younger. But the point is, I'm so sure where, when I'm going to die that I don't have any fear because it's going to be my decision. People say, well, how can that be your decision when accidents happen? Accidents happen when you're not conscious. When you're living by the law of averages, which is you're living by race consciousness, by human consciousness, by the consciousness that is everywhere present. When you're living by that, you're getting an average experience. And when you're having an average experience, then 30% of you are going to have cancer, or 30% of the people out there are going to have cancer, 30% are going to have heart conditions, 30% are going to have diabetes, 30% are going to be obese. Whatever the data is, you're subject to the law of averages. But when you're a conscious creator and you're using the mind, you're not subject to that. You're above that. So you're not the average. You're the, people, you're the one bringing the average up as high as it is. You see, remember that. When there's an average, there are people way above the average. The question you've got to ask yourself is, where do you want to be? Do you want to be average? Do you want to be below average? Or do you want to be above it? What is enlightenment? I've only been talking about that for seven weeks. <laughs> enlightenment. And can one live in a state of enlightenment in this world? Enlightenment is really living in connection with all of life. It is being one with the divine, being one with life. It is living in a constant state of love. Can one live in that state? One can have moments in that state. I don't believe one lives in that state continuously because to live in that state of enlightenment continuously means there's no contrast. If there's no contrast, then there's nothing that's going to stimulate us to create more. Well, our purpose is to create. Even Jesus had contrast. Think about all the things that happened to him. He's supposed to be one of the most enlightened beings that ever came to this planet. 
And yet he had contrast. So he had his moments when he was in the temple with all the people there and he wiped out the booze and stuff. When he had his moments where he looked, said to the father, why, have, why hast thou forsaken me? He had moments of doubt. Everyone, Buddha, the same thing. Krishna, the same thing. All of the great spiritual avatars had their moments. But they were able to live the moments of being in one more, more con- in continuity, more continuously, or more often than most. There are people today living as these people. We just don't hear about them today. Because we're not in a society that focuses on that. We're in a society that focuses on what makes the news. So enlightenment is something that each of you have been enlightened at some point in your life. You have had that moment. The key is by through a conscious choice, through meditation and prayer, can you have it more often? That's what I'm seeking. One more time today than yesterday. One more second today than yesterday. One more moment today. Can I have it when I'm talking with you? Can I have it when I'm with you? Can I have it when I'm with you? You see, it's about can you be in love with no matter where you are and who you're with. It's always asking the question, what would love do in this situation? You see, they say, what would Jesus do? But what did Jesus represent? Jesus represented love, pure and simple. (laughs) What question do you have that has not been answered? God. What would it be like to live one hour at the highest level of love? What would it be like to live one hour in the highest expression of love continuously for one hour? I don't know what that is, but I would love to experience it. That's the question I would say is my biggest question right now. Because that's as much as I can go to. You see, I can't imagine more than that. Because my experience has taken me where I've had five minutes, six minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, where I've been in that state, but I've never gone to that hour. So for me, that's what I'm seeking. What are some good practices to achieve belief in your good, in additions, for affirmations and vibrations? That's next Sunday. Next Sunday, you want to be here. We're going to be talking about how to reclaim our power within. I'm going to talk about the power of beads. The bead day. Beads. These. Mala beads. They're not sacred. I did that last week, right? They're not sacred. They're just beads. But we can use those beads and implant thoughts in our mind. And when we implant those thoughts in our mind, we change our subjective consciousness. I will have beads next week for you all. I've, uh, I've bought the special beads that I love, the Rudraksha beads. They're a special seed that has a feeling, a texture on it, so that when you're moving the bead, it's a feeling. So you're energetically vibrating with what you're saying in your mind, what you're speaking, and what you're feeling as you're doing it. You're engaging three different modalities, and you're also hearing it. And engaging those modalities together, you're shifting your subconscious mind. And when you shift your subconscious mind, the overall nature of what you think changes. When the overall nature of what you think changes, your beliefs change, your experience changes. I've done 1,400 affirmations today already. I drove here. I had my mala beads. I'm doing an affirmation 108 times. I do that because when I'm shifting my consciousness, I don't want the news out there about um, Syria. I'm Miley Cyrus. I don't want to walk around all day long thinking and talking about Miley Cyrus. So I'd rather put into my consciousness an affirmation that's going to benefit me. Okay? What is the influence of Buddhism and Hinduism on science of mind? Buddhism and Hinduism are the the Eastern modalities, and their modality is basically meditation. They have this meditation that they go through, and they go into oneness and to stillness. And so Ernest Holmes said, love and law are the way to get to the divine. When he's talked about love, he meant connection to God, and that's the connection through meditation. When he talked about law, it's directing the mind, which is focusing the power within you to create. So he believed that there had to be a balance between love and law, a balance between the Eastern way, the Buddhist way, the Hinduist way, and the the Western way, the Judeo-Christian way of directing the power through our belief structure. When I was in India, 
we were there, and I remember it so clearly, we were in the midst of this natural disaster, and the facilitator of the group kept saying, okay, okay, we're just trusting in the guru. And she was on the phone with the guru in another part of India, and the guru says to be still. And we would hear this four or five times a day. And so everyone's there, we're meditating for six more days while we're in the midst of this disaster. We're meditating, the guru says be still, the guru says be still. Finally, she says, well, the guru says be still, but there's going to be, the monsoons are going to start in two days. That's when in prayer, I got the clear answer, it's time to get the hell out of Dodge. And that's when I partnered with Naranjan and we found the path through the Himalayas to get to the helipad so that we could be helicoptered to safety to be out of there because we had, there was no way we were going to be there another three months and be safe. At that point, when we came back from finding this path and we sat down with these 38 other people and we said to them, we found the path. This is what we're doing tomorrow. There was no doubt that we were doing it. The guru is not someone outside of yourselves. This is where the Eastern gets messed up, I think. And it's not that the gurus taught that. It's that they built a religion around a person instead of around a teaching. See, that's the fallacy that we make, that we make the mistake in spirituality. We build a religion around a person, and it's never about the person. It's about the teaching, and the teaching is universal. Buddha never said, worship me. Jesus never said, worship me. Buddha never said, I'm creating Buddhism. Jesus never said, I'm creating Christianity. They never said that. Mankind afterwards created that. So if you haven't heard this, I'm going to say it again. Don't believe a word I say. Test it for yourself. Shannon K. Mac never believes me. That's not true. But doubt everything I say. Doubt what anyone says until you've proven it yourself. Because the key thing that I want you to know, this is my, this is my greatest desire for you, is that you fully understand that everything that you've been seeking is right where you are. That the wisdom that you're looking for is you. The person you're looking for to fulfill your God-sized desire is you. The love that you're seeking is the love that's looking at you when you look in the mirror. It's you. I want to thank you for joining us today. I am so grateful that you took your time to watch or listen to this message. If you found this message beneficial, I would ask you to go to our website. Once there, click on the Contribute button and experience the joy of conscious and purposeful giving. It is through your gifts that we are able to bring this message to the world. I would also ask you to please Share this message with anyone you feel might benefit. Again, I want to thank you for joining me and the Agape community as together we bring joy to life.